start by thanking you for the honor of a conversation. I think these are some of the most important issues of our times. It affects not only commerce, but also lots of social welfare. And so uh, I'm hoping we'll get the slides up. Um, I want to cover two things today, which happen to be one, kind of the regulatory issues, about kind of the responsibilities of platforms and how we might think about regulating platforms. Then also some of the social consequences of things like misinformation. So how do we deal with things of that sort? And I want to actually do that through a single lens, which is information. We heard some wonderful talks earlier about data and the importance of data and what it is to do. So I want to take a look at these two questions of regulation of platforms and of misinformation through the lens of information. These issues have been w with us now in quite some pressing times. So I wanted to have some fun with this particular slide. Here we can see an Amazon player wiping out a competitor on the field but what's interesting here is that the empire, uh, Amazon is also the judge, saying they're the ones, yes, this player is safe and it was okay to wipe out the competition. So it's interesting in these digital markets what's happening and is it, the, is it fair for the same platform to play in these fields that they're also the judge, jury, and executioner? And it doesn't matter which country we're in. If we look here in the Digital Markets Act with the Cremay report we're gonna hear from Jacques later today, um, the Congre U.S. congressional reports, U.K., Australian government, or the Chinese legislation, these are fairly use, um, universal and international problems. So how are we going to deal with this? Why does traditional antitrust fail in such markets? I want to give you at least three observations. One of them is the question of market share and market dominance. Is market dominance abused? Well, the question comes up, is Amazon in books, cloud, e-commerce, home devices, groceries? Is Alibaba in e-commerce, cloud, payments, movies, logistics? Is Google in search, maps, self-driving cars? What's the boundary on the industry? In economics, we teach about antitrust as restricting output. So you move from monopoly to competition to, uh, you know, duopoly to competition. And so the test is often restricted output. But Google doesn't restrict your searches or your maps. Alibaba and Amazon do not restrict your purchases, Facebook, we chat, do not restrict your posts, so that test doesn't work. Or if we use pricing, usually you look at above marginal cost as uh, an ability to sh or show market power, or maybe below marginal cost as predatory pricing to drive out competition. But in network markets, the optimal price is zero, so that test also fails us. One intuition is to come with this, so some work we've done with Jeff Parker is actually on platforms as inverted firms. The concept is to think of a firm as an orchestrator of third party production. So defining the market boundaries is hard when third parties are producing applications or selling the books or creating the devices in there. Similarly, if third parties are producing the value, Airbnb is doing it, um, drivers on uh, Uber, you have zero marginal costs of production. So of course the platform has no interest in restricting because every single unit increase is a value unit increase to the platform. And of course we know from two-sided markets that the optimal price is often zero in this context because you're actually subsidizing one part of the side of the market. So I'd like to distinguish some of the questions that have been asked from the ones I think we should ask. So in Europe often the question is gonna be, how do we create competition and fair contestable markets? Candidly, I think we need a better question. So the question I would like to ask is, how do we create wealth and innovation and then figure out how to divide that fairly? So one of the things I want to do is to give you perhaps two methods of doing that today. I also want to comment on some of the existing legislation. So we'll have a wonderful talk later, but I say the Digital Markets Act does a number of things really well. So on the left-hand column, I won't necessarily go into the things that are doing right. Matter of fact, some of the things the Europeans and the Chinese are both doing right is, you're taking action. Uh, my wife often tells me, don't sit there like a stone, take action. So she always wants me to do something. And I think in Europe and China, they are in fact taking action. Uh, in the US, uh, I think the Congress is either sitting there like a stone or throwing stones, but they're not taking action. But there are some areas that I think need work. And just to highlight two or three, one of them is you cannot combine data sources without opt-in, which I think prevents the creation of additional value. Or the platform often can't use data to enter markets, but in any other context, we welcome entry because it creates valuable competition. Or 
there are presumptive restrictions on mergers and acquisitions which may or may not necessarily be valuable in the long term. Let me illustrate. I don't know how many of you wear smart devices. I happen to wear a Fitbit. If it's the case that Apple were to buy Fitbit, then you would have monopoly, and that's bad. That is not something that we want to have happen. On the contrast, if Google is to buy Fitbit, and it doesn't get crushed by Apple, in fact, it becomes pro-competitive because now it has the resources of a bigger network to compete more effectively with the Apple smartwatch. That actually is the creation of competition. So I think that's actually a good example where that, is not, that partnership is not bad, but in fact is actually good. Or to give you other examples, we've heard a little bit about the digital, um, not just the American Architects, but general uh, data privacy regulation, GDPR, and several of the complications of that. With data portability, it tends to fragment the data. And the data show after the introduction of GDPR, several complications occurred. Ad targeting became less effective. Small e-commerce sites lost ground. New app development fell, and venture capital firms invested fewer euros in startups in Europe. It fragmented the data and introduced some challenges. I'd like to see if there are some better mechanisms to achieve similar results than what happened in that case. So I really want to focus on some of the principles for designing some of the regulation. So I want to focus on these three. How is it that platforms create value and do policy interventions respect how firms do produce that value? The second is how to capture value. Allocative efficiency should share that value fairly among the various stakeholders. We heard in law earlier wonderful observations about the supplier of data, the holder of data, and the user of data. How do we involve all parties to create that and use it efficiently? And then also, how do we account for dynamic efficiency through time? It's not just efficiency at one moment, but we want innovation. We want next period generation of value in addition to what we have previously. So I'd like to claim the issue, isn't, the issue is creating value and defining it fairly, not creating competition, really in order to create that value badly. All we need to actually is figure out how value is created. Let me offer a few suggestions on how we might do just that. Imagine we, this is a two-sided market. On the top row, you might see consumers, and on the bottom row, you might see sellers. Now, imagine under data portability, you have the right to pull your data out of the system. Well, what this means is you can take your own data, but not that of others. So if your friends make posts about you, or if you are a um, merchant, and others actually have others posted prices, when you take your data off, you lose all of that context. Why? Because it's not your data, it's their data. But you have lower dimensionality data, and you can't make as accurate decisions in that case. There are several problems with that kind of approach or data portability. To enumerate them, one, you lose the context. You, can't, you will make inferior decisions without that context. Two, data stagnates. That's a stock rather than a flow and you would like to have the recent data as well as all of it. And we just heard lots about privacy. If you have multiple sources, you've got multiple sources of data breach. It's also impotent. Once your data is removed from the structure, you cannot use it to make a purchase or receive a benefit from a friend. And finally, what about monitoring? If you're a user, you might like to know what the platform is doing to you, what ads they are showing you, what misinformation they are presenting to you. But once your data is out of that, you have no way to monitor, so you've lost monitoring capability. What do we do? I'd like to propose an idea of a new user right. The idea here is to bring the algorithm to the data where it is resident, rather than pull the data out of the infrastructure. What does this mean? We'll go back to our diagram here. If you, as an individual user, can import the algorithm to your infrastructure where the data is, you preserve all of the context. You can make better decisions because you have all of it to give you a more complete enumeration of what's happening. Not only do you preserve the context, but it's completely fresh because you're seeing all of the data. So you get extra benefits there. Privacy is also um, presented because there's only one throat to choke. There's only one place where the data is going to be accessed. And indeed, if some third party behaves badly, 
you turn off their API access to cut them off. They never had the data, so you don't have to worry about them disposing of the data once you have told them that they no longer have access. It's completely potent because you can use it to make a purchase or receive a benefit, again, because it stays within the infrastructure. And of course, now you can monitor what it is that you show, and you can actually compare the data that you have. It has a number of other benefits in it. Another thing that I'd like to show, we heard wonderful arguments today about how the auctions markets capture value for the firm. So I'll pose the question to you as the audience. Consider Facebook. Consider this is a demand curve here, and it's just going to let me do the, that's not showing up. There's a demand curve and a supply curve. In an advertising market, really simple question, who is capturing the surplus and how much of it? We heard earlier about exactly the problem of, well, in a Vickery auction or a second price auction, what happens is you place the bids and you then get the surplus from each of these folks, and that surplus is then transferred, of course, to the platform. Network effects then effectively create lock-in over this, and data portability doesn't change this. After you've moved the data, Facebook still possesses all of the ads, and they capture the revenue. Now contrast this with in situ data rights. What happens if you have an API, and you can now invite Google in to show you ads on your Facebook network? Now what happens? In this context, we've just invited competition. Google could show you ads, Facebook can show you ads, Amazon could show you ads, but in order to do that, they're going to then, in order, Google would then motivate that, your permission, by giving you a share of that value. That creates the competition, that then will then lead the value to go to the consumer or the, end, or the user as opposed to the platform. Notice, if Facebook's algorithm is better than Google's algorithm, it gets to keep the incremental surplus, and so we've competed away only that portion for which it was not adding value. We've actually managed to capture some of the dynamic effects in there and actually share the value back with the users. Also, why do firms buy smaller firms for their data? Well, there are usually two reasons. Reason number one is you want access to that data. Reason number two is you want to keep it from competitors. But with an in-situ data right, the first reason is diminished because now you could access the data by rewarding the users themselves as opposed to buying the entire firm. Likewise, you are less motivated to acquire data to keep it from competitors for the simple reason your competitors could reward your users for sharing that data and now there's not little you can do about it because they have that right. Now it's a more elegant or more equitable solution for solving that particular problem. With this I'd like to tend to a different, oh, there's actually data to support this, by the way. We did a study of all the firms that opened APIs between 2005 and 2017 to see if openness affected value. In fact, we found the rather remarkable result that firms that opened APIs grew 2% uh, in value over, sorry, 4% in value over two years and 38% in 16 years. What's interesting is because they control the API, they capture most of that value. Uh, and if the user controlled it, they could actually c um, capture some of that value. So openness matters, and notice it does increase over time. The results turn out to be quite robust. If you focus on this line here, post adoption of the API times API, it turns out it doesn't matter if using it all the firms, you eliminate the top 20 firms, or if you focus on industries with low API usage, or if you focus on low technology industries, the results are still extremely robust. And finally, um, even the, the effects grow over time. So if it was post, it was pre-2012 versus post-2012, the effects actually grow over time. So openness does create growth and it's quite robust. Um, we also had instruments to see if we could actually imply that it was causal. It's a really interesting set of results. I'd like to address the question of then fake news. We had an interesting uh, observation in the uh, kind of the Nobel Prize panel on the very first day about how do we know what's true and what's good or bad information. I'll take a moment and see if I can give you some thinking on that. I would argue that it's not the fakeness of news that matters. Here in this case, much false news just doesn't matter. Is Pluto a planet or is it an asteroid? Um, or a restaurant here, Jay's, has a slogan, 
eat at Jay's and live forever. That's provably false, but it's a great meal. Or there's much true information that does matter. In this case, the Russians used um, true information to suppress minority votes uh, in black neighborhoods or animate guns rights activists in um, some other Republican neighborhoods. Or anti-vaxxers might use two truths to create a lie about a person that did take the vaccine and then did die, but the cause of death had nothing to do with the vaccine. And also, fake news that's disbelieved just doesn't matter. True information that is disbelieved can matter a lot. So I want to argue it's not the truth that matters because you can't be liable for truth and you can't be dispossessed of truth, making it a bad locus for the operation of law. I'd like to paraphrase the question somewhat differently. I think the problem is to clear communications of prop information that causes decision error or negative externalities. We heard a wonderful, interesting summary of the informational externalities, and these are negative ones, whether it's in insurrections or anti-vaccinations or shootings in pizza parlors. And I note, as a matter of law, you can be liable for decision errors and for externalities, so that actually helps. In the West, actually, in the, in the United States, we have a particularly hard problem, which is government cannot intervene in free speech. So could we design mechanisms in which there isn't a central authority that would still work, even in those contexts. And I want to argue that we can. And here's, I want to give you an intuition. I won't give you the, we don't have time to cover the full method, but I want to give you an intuition. So um, we heard earlier, I think Eric Maskin had a really nice observation about the centralization versus decentralization debate with von Hayek. The first fundamental welfare theorem in economics is basically that a decentralized market of buyers and suppliers acting in their own self-interest lead to, in effect, a social optimum. Why? Each uses their private information to bid up or down the value of various resources. The original insight you could tribute to Adam Smith all the way back to 1776. Von Hayek crystallized this in the debates in the 1930s. It was proven formally by Pareto, Arrow, and De Bureau. But it doesn't work if their information asymmetries or externalities, those break down. But is it possible to then restore efficiency by then pulling in information economics and externality economics? What I'd like to assert to you is if we can add signals and screens, if we can cause the internalization of negative externalities, then it's possible that the operation of speakers and listeners can lead us to a near optimum acting in their own interest so we can reduce in misinformation with no central intervention whatsoever. So if it could work even in the United States, it might even be able to work anywhere because it's the most restricted conditions where government can't touch it at all. But there are some other mechanisms that we can do this. I invite you, I've got a full paper on the mechanisms that would actually try to implement this, but I think it is possible to reduce misinformation with no central authority, um, which gives us a really powerful set of tools for going after some of the issues. So I'd like to summarize simply if we look at those design principles, really what we want to do is to respect how firms in the platform economy create value. As inverted firms, they create as much value outside as they do inside by the orchestrating third-party value creation. That's why breaking them up or division tends to actually spread information across fewer resources, which then causes a different challenge. Allocative efficiency needs to share that value fairly, but if we break up to smaller firms or we divide the assets into fragmented silos, then you're spreading it over smaller value, and so you've shifted the control point. That does um, reduce the ability to capture value, but it also reduces the ability to create value. So we need mechanisms that do both, such as the in situ mechanism, which allows multiple parties to create that value, and the competition on top then shares that value. And then we get the innovation from managing dynamic efficiency by using the algorithmic use cases and not gatekeeping. We let multiple parties to try to create that value. And again, open systems show demonstrable growth. They actually do better. Again, the issue is creating value fairly, is that creating value and dividing it fairly, not creating competition and dividing it badly. And in the case of misinformation, we shift the control point to the speaker who has the best information on whether something is true or false or not. We can use it for fake news, we can use it for fake products and get them to self-correct their bad behavior in ways that curb misinformation or curb even fake products. So with that summary, um, I think I'd like to turn it over to uh, the next speaker. Thank you.